There seem to be many differences between traditional corporate media and the emerging new investigative platforms we see today. And I hope that this panel can help us to work out what these differences are, which are the most important ones, what, they, what impact they can have, and what this all means for the future of investigative journalism. First of all, I think there is to mention that we have a chance for a fundamental shift in the economic framework doing publishing. This involves many issues from the mode of financing to the more profound question of ownership of production, distribution, and consumption. I would appreciate if the new platforms find a way to leave behind the capitalistic business model of the corporate media. It is not longer just the workforce that is being exploited. We, as consumers of journalistic work, are exploited just as much, paywall and all. I know that the question of proper funding and financial issues is quite crucial, so all our panelists, I'm sure, will talk about that in their, uh, 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 in their talk and explain their approach a little bit later. But for me, the most interesting difference is the change in the self-image of journalism. For a long time, good journalism was considered to be something objective, something where the journalists working on a story are more like watching and recording ghosts, uninvolved, with no intentions, agendas, or even worse, desires of their own. I believe that no good journal investigative journalist since the beginning of time ever lived up to the stereotype, but they had to hide this from their editors and their readers. They have to disguise it in their articles and waiting for a chance to write a commentary piece in the newspaper so that they are not punished by their peer group for an individual opinion. This seems to have changed with many of the new investigative platforms we see today, and some of them here on the panel with me. When I read an article in Netzpolitik.org, of course I expected it to be as truthfully as it can be, not reporting anything wrong, nor leaving out important bits but I do not expect it to be objective. On the contrary, I embrace journalism with a cause, even if it's not my own cause. I think it helps to put information into a context, and there simply is no, no such thing as an objective context. For traditional journalism, this seems disgusting, but is it really? Is the convergence of journalism and hacktivism a wrong path? And if it is, what are we losing that only the allegedly immaculate old school journalism can provide? Is it the special legal protections journalists enjoy in too few countries? And if so, is this protection reserved for the journalistic class with its own rules whom to accept as a new member? Are the blockers, data journalists and hacktivists, are, just, are they just the new kids on the block you simply don't play with? Jake proposed yesterday that these kids be allowed into the club as journalists to benefit from their class privileges. But is that really the right way? Should we think about how to enter a class, to become a member of a class, instead of thinking about how to get rid of this fucking system? I, I, I would be very surprised. I would be very surprised that the privilege of journalistic protection comes without strings attached. Maybe even just the attempt of non-compliance is punishable in these circles. I don't know, I'm not a journalist myself. But all our panelists are, and I'm really looking forward to hear their opinions, uh, and I hope they can shed some insight into these matters, where I'll, I only have questions but no answers. So let me first introduce for the first talk, Simona Leva. She's, what, Levy, she's from Spain, she's from Mixnet, and uh, that's a group of hacktivists for internet freedom, which matches nicely what we are doing, and I hope she can give a very unique perspective on journalism in Spain. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So first of all, I have to uh, say that, uh, as usual, my uh, presentation will be held uh, in something very similar to English, but not English. So. <laughs> If really we keep open the dialogue, if you don't understand what I'm saying, you just raise your hand and we try to reword it, okay? Thank you, really. 
so I am I'm Simona. Um, I come from this group. It's called uh, Xnet. Uh, we are very normal people. I'm a theater director. In fact, I am a tango dancer. Uh, we are a, a group between two and eight. Uh, two, uh, we have a cook, a gardener, two chemists, uh, an interior designer, a musician, and a tech girl. And uh, so you are asking yourself uh, what I'm doing here. Yeah, great, because I also think we were not supposed to, be, to become journalists. So uh, this panel, in this panel, we were asked to present the challenge we faced. So I think I will uh, explain you exactly uh, the story of uh, one of the devices that we are using. It's a device with a difficult translation. It's called Kinseme Parrato, and I would define it like uh, an holistic open source uh, Jalim Bankers device. Uh, and this is a bit the story that I will use uh, as an example on which is, I think, the, the difficulties we can face uh, why we try to tell the truth from the, citizens, from, from the citizen. I need to, to give a bit uh, of a context of, of Spain. Uh, I want to bring very good news of Spain, and so I need to give another warning because the propaganda have reached very far. And I want to make clear that all the good news that are coming from the Spanish Revolution, none of them are related to Podemos, right? So we are doing a, a very nice uh, network at the revolution in Spain in 2011, in the, the after Ar uh, Arab Spring and the rise of the Indignados movement. And uh, we are really uh, succeeding very uh, good result in many fields because we have, this is a bit the structure on the phase of the Indignados movement after the moment of the square that you all have seen the new, in the news. Now we are separating a network divide in a different node in a network and in which node uh, are uh, taking care of particular topics and skill like health, housing, even el the electro uh, electoral field. Uh, we are working on corruption, we are working on the internet freedom and uh, this is the structure of the revolution and in this revolution Podemos is not there. Podemos, this is, uh, this is not the topic of my talk, but I just want you to know. Uh, these are the big data proving that Podemos is not only not participating be, uh, to the organization of the Indignado movement and is not helping the Indignado movement to grow, to become a really uh, independent citizen movement, but is just co-optating that and is doing the same that the Stalinistic have done in the 1936 with the uh, anarchist movement in Spain by destroying it and losing the war, they are trying to do this in, uh, in Spain the same uh, uh, by trying to cope with this effort. But they are not succeeding. So I want to bring you good news from Spain. And I think some of the things we do are, uh, are part of this big network revolution happening in Spain uh, and uh, can be used as an example of how we work and why it works. So this is what we do with Xnet. Uh, these are the topics, and on the other side are the devices that we are launching uh, around uh, those topics. I just wanted to uh, talk about two of them. Uh, one is a uh, 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 leak box, uh, which is called uh, El Busson de Xnet. And is, uh, of course, we have learned a lot in this very room from WikiLeaks and Julian, and we have always uh, worked uh, in Xnet with the leaks since 2008, but uh, having met uh, WikiLeaks and worked with them and understanding them and, and learn from them have really uh, brought us to uh, a more um, uh, efficient and structured and, uh, um, system, but I would like to talk about this after that. After speaking uh, of the holistic uh, open source Jalen Banker device. So, how this device started is one year after the Indignado Revolution, in the starting of the Indignado Revolution in 2011, is in 2012, and the idea starts from this schema. This is not uh, uh, a schema from a radical tango dancer like I am is from El País, mainstream newspaper. And this is the typical news that we were having to swallow in, the, in Spain during uh, in, the, in the years of the crisis, saying that the crisis was fall falling from the sky. But if you observe this schema, what you can see is this. 
he, the Spanish crisis, the economical Spanish crisis, if this is the hole we had in our economy, the seven part of this hole will be, was made by one only bank. The first one you say above, the Bankia Bank. So us, with our brain of da dance players and uh, uh, cooks, uh, accordionists, chemists, etc., we reach an incredible conclusion. If one only bank is responsible for the seven part of the all of an economy, maybe the directive of this bank are responsible for it. Maybe. It's just a supposition. Uh, the other thing is that they were selling, the same people, they were selling um, shares in the st uh, stock market that in a six months come to a price, I don't remember which one, but I, I remember where it follows in six months. It follows each share to 0 0,01 uh, you, uh, cents, which means that 300,000 people in Spain have lost all their savings because they have uh, bought uh, shares of this bank. So, start, starting from this uh, deep financial analyze, we have decided as citizen to launch a device. The device was called Kinseme Parato. Later on, I will translate it. It's the one I translate as a holistic open source uh, Jalen Banker device. And uh, we decide, of course, there is many responsible, but we need to, in, in a war, you need to choose one uh, starting point. So we choose this guy. You might know him. You uh, forget for a moment the Alcatraz sign, the, the, the Alcatraz sign come after. Now, just look the guy. You, uh, you know him, you don't know, but you know him, because he was the president of the IMF just before Stroskan. So he was, organizing the, the, he was organizing the global crisis also for you all. So he's a friend of all of us. Uh, and this guy was a banker, then he was vice minister in Spain, and then he was a, a minister of economy in Spain, then uh, director of the IMF. Then he came back and he became the, the president of this bank we saw before, Bankia. So we decide to open a, a court case against him to the, uh, to the um, Supreme Court. And we have no evidences whatsoever except the evidence I just showed to you, which is the logic. So we open this court case and then we launch the device uh, in Spain and we uh, organize a very strong community. We thought, no, uh, one more thing, this guy is kind of the Margaret Thatcher of Spain. He was the guy of the uh, economical conservative revolution uh, and he was kind of an untouchable guy. So when we launched this campaign with this Alcatraz, like here, uh, it was like this was Margaret Thatcher for, for the Spanish. So it just changed the narrative very strongly. We uh, opened the court case, the court case was accepted and so we have to now fund evidences and fund money. Because you, you have to know that to put in jail a banker, you need 15 to 20 euros per year, but it's a flat rate. When you have it, you can put in bank as many bankers uh, as you want. As you will see, now we have 100 of them with the same price. It's very, it's very convenient. Uh, so we build a very strong community. As I say, we are just a group of uh, five, around five, six person, but we have built around this device a very strong community in a network manner so that the people keep their independence, but they, uh, they uh, bring solution, legal solution, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, especially we did a very, uh, two things, the crowdfunding, which is very important because every year we have to uh, start again to, to, do, to pay the flat rate. Uh, so every year we, do, we have to do this crowdfunding. Normally it's done in one day. The first time we launched it was the first political crowdfunding in Spain. 11,000 people have tried to put money. They destroy completely the server. They blow the internet. But in five hours we had all the money to put in jail our, uh, our previous uh, Minister of Economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it's... So what, what now? Uh, no, and the other important part of it is this 
leaking box, the, the XNet box, because all the evidences that we have brought in, little by little, were coming from people that leaked to us. You must know that in Spain there is no, no law for transparency. There is one, but uh, often when you ask information to the institution, you get a fine, even 3,000 euros fine, because you shouldn't ask things to the institution, of course. Uh, uh, and you, uh, so there is a context uh, in which people trust more the other citizen in this network revolution than not any institution in Spain. So we are kind of a, ref a reference for corruption. In our box we receive around 50 documents per, per month. Uh, and we are kind of the, the catalyzer of, of uh, the, the, cor the issue on corruption in Spain. So, result. We had a leak, a very important leak, uh, of mails, the mails of the bankers, and uh, this guy and uh, the, the directive of this bank um, with the politician. Result, let's make the, the long story short. At this right moment, we have 87, uh, 87 uh, bankers on trial. We have uh, 22 people from the Conservative Party in power, 15 people from the Socialist Party in power also before. Four people of Izquierda Unida, uh, which are only four, but they are very strong and we are helping the power of both for a long time. And ten people from the two main unions in Spain. They are all on trial. The guy, this is the future Mar Margaret Thatcher. Now you can see him is in, in his last travel to Switzerland. He has to travel in second class. He's sitting in the cheapest uh, seat in the middle. And this was his last trip because now he got his passport. Uh, he cannot leave the country. Um, so, uh, and the last thing, so they are all on trial. I think we're going to get them in jail in 2017, all these people. This is what I can promise to you. And what we also succeed, because this idea of the crisis, uh, and uh, they have cut a lot of uh, uh, welfare and, and uh, as everywhere else. Uh, the other idea was to that we're going to get rescued by their money, not by this, this bank uh, is nationalized, so we are paying for for the, uh, w what they have stolen. Uh, so we also say when we launch this device that um, we're going to get our money back from these people. The, uh, two weeks ago, the Supreme Court had said finally that 2 billion euros, 2 billion, I think it's after 6-0, I, I, I never know how much is it, but I think it's at least 9-0. Uh, a 2 with 9-0 minimum. They have to give back to savers only to small savers. So we are, this, we succeeded already. We get the money back. And then we're gonna bring them in jail in seven minutes. So everything is good news, but. <laughs> and I get it to my hand, eh? <laughs> everything is good news, but. Why you don't know this story? Why in Spain, almost no one knows this story? Because uh, if you go to any newspapers, in Spain, every day you, ca you have a news on Rodrigo Rato. Yesterday they have cut him off other money that he was going, I don't know where. So every day Rodrigo Rato is in the news. But no one knows that uh, uh, Rodrigo Rato is, what is happening to all these people is a cause of a coalition of citizens, simple citizens, not institution, not the press, no, nobody. So uh, we have discovered something very important by launching this device as normal citizen that is very easy to put in jail and to court uh, bankers, corrupt politicians, but what is very, very difficult is that they, uh, that is known, that is just daily, by, uh, that is, this is done not by their equals, by institution, by judges, by other politicians, is done by normal and everyday people. Not the press, not even the independent press, because the one that, the, that uh, we leaked to this material, this very important mail material, was an independent newspaper. In, in, in fact, we tried first with The Guardian, but they didn't want it. But, and then we tried with an independent uh, newspaper in Spain. They uh, never recognized, not us, but in general, that the sources is the citizenship. Not the government, not the new political party, not the old political party are trying to 
uh, tell the real story to the citizen. So one more thing, with one, again, the problem we think is not the corruption, it's the empowerment of the people against the monopoly of the truth of the media, the government, and the political parties. It's not about our ego trip. It's about the fact that they want to send the people home. They let them believe that someone very special as a politician or a judge will save their life and that the TV will then tell the story. But we don't want to go home. We want to be citizens in control of our institution and the press in this case, very rarely is happening on that because they are part of this hour, uh, aura of the elite. And I think that the real democracy is only the control of the citizen on their institution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I was really surprised to hear that the next revolution in Spain will start in a courtroom, which is probably not a bad idea, but if it takes later on to the streets, uh, I hope it see the right the changes. It starts in the street. Indignados movement yeah. started. No. <laughs> yes and no. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Advi Plano. Uh, he's from France. He has been 25 years with the Le Monde, a big new French newspaper, the last 10 years as the editor-in-chief. Uh, he founded a new uh, media platform, uh, Mediapart, in 2008, and this is one of the very few daily and uh, online appearing uh, news media we have, independent news media we have in Europe. Thank you very much, Edwi, for being here. Okay. The panel is yours. Thank you. Hmm? Hello, everybody. You. You are the other. Uh, first of all, I must apologize twice, first for my bad English, and also for my old-fashioned manners. No slides, no PowerPoint, only this booklet <laughs> on paper. That's a, a little red book, a new red book. I think it's, perhaps it's better than the old one. You can find it on the table outside with all the results and all the figures of Mediapart. First, I want to, to take a big thank you to all the organizers, the Center for Investigative Journalism, and all the partners to organize this meeting. Because our challenge is not, and Simona was an illustration, it's not a technological, professional one, journalistic one. It's a big democratic issue. During the last past centuries, all industrial technological revolution create new democratic challenge, a new fight between the old world and the new world. In this situation, the question of the right to know and the freedom of speech are not specific questions. They are the big, the big way to put a real agenda of the people. We have the right to know. We need the freedom of speech. It's the big issue to create the way to invent new replies, new solutions, new hopes. In this situation, it's a big challenge for journalism. There is a crisis of trust between the people and our profession. I have since 63 years. I come from the old world, 25 years in Le Monde, 40 years of journalism, the old press, and the story of Mediapart, I will explain, is the story of guys who coming from this old world. They want to prove that there is new solution for our profession, for journalism, for the trust between people 
and information in the new digital world. It's a question also to create a new professional culture, a new collective culture to invent this new reply. Mediapart. Mediapart is a sort of laboratory, like a research or resistance laboratory. We create Mediapart exactly eight years ago, in March 2008, and we create Mediapart on three bases. First, investigative culture. That was my job and my way and my reputation before. But I think that with the digital revolution, investigative is not a part of journalism. People can have access to many information, free information, share information. For our profession, our specific profession, at the service of the public, we must create value of information in all, all sectors. You cannot only repeat information which are free. You must find new information, specific information, revelations. You must discover new information, not only investigative about secret service, about secret state, but all the sectors, education, social questions, politics, economy. I think that the digital revolution creates a new opportunity to refund journalism. You know this old sentence of George Orwell, journalism is printing, printing what someone else does not want printed. Everything else is public relations. I precise now, not only everything else, but especially powers, political powers, finance powers, military powers, surveillance powers. And that's the reason Mediapart create its, its reputation each day, each week, each month, with revelation, big revelation. You heard sometimes about that, them, the Karachi affair, the Betancourt affair, the Cahuzac affair but all sectors, finance, corruption, tax fraud, arm dealings, politics and money, conflict of interest, and so on. Even you will find next week a new, a new big European investigation with the pool of media in Europe, the Spiegel, the other media, European media, and also media part. You will find it around Thursday or Friday next week. Investigation is not, I repeat, uh, a specialty. It must be all the earth of our professional culture. As journalists, you must create new information. You must find information that power want not to be known in public. That's the first specificity of Mediapart. The second one is that we are not only an investigative, but a totally digital media. And that means totally participative. For journalism, the digital revolution creates a new relationship between the public. We are not on the stage, up our audience. We are at the same floor. We must discuss with all the citizens. They can criticize us, they can discuss with us, 
then can publish in our participative media part. There is the journal, that's our information, and there is the club. All subscribers of Mediapart can publish information, comments, and in a free speech tradition, there is no a priori moderation. We trust the public, and the public can even fight with us, and we will be better with this new relation. We are not like a cast up the public of the media. That's the second aspect of media part. The third one, and I must say that we were really pioneer when we take this challenge in 2008, is to not the paywall, but this idea that the false, the face free model, the advertising model, is a model that destroys value, destroy value of information, destroy value of public debate, destroy value of democracy, indeed. Why? Because this free model with advertising where it's uh, immediate superficiality will be linked to entertainment, to the logic of audience, not the public debate with consciousness, with uh, debate for a best world, a best democracy, but only a big, a big show. And the consequence is infotainment. This model is not the model for information, for this new relationship with the public. And we, against all the predictions, we say people can buy information. If it's information with trust, trust with originality, with no advertising, and that's the result of Mediapart. Journalism, investigative journalism, digital media, participative media, and finally, only our readers can buy us. That's our baseline. No state money, no private owners, only this relationship with the people. The fact you can find uh, not only in this booklet, if you go on Mediapart in the free part, it's the club, yes, 11 minutes, <laughs> say 15, it's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, I got this, <laughs> with the, <laughs> okay. And uh, you can find all the figures there, and you go on my blog on Mediapart, you can download this. The figures is very simple. Simple. We got at this time near 120,000 subscribers. That's half people who buy daily newspaper on all platform, all support, like Le Monde or Le Figaro, the two best, biggest, not best, biggest <laughs> newspaper in France. We challenge them, really. It's not uh, a wall because we got uh, an audience more than 3.5 million of unique visitors per month because when you are a subscriber, you can offer an article. All the club and the participative part is open. You can read and you can read the resume of the articles. The result is also finance result. Our turnover last year was more than 10 million euros, and our profit was 1.8 million. <laughs> the last point. 
And for me, the big question. The last years, all media understand that this model must be tried, and all media create new freemium or paywall model. But our successful story, like uh, a very specific story, like an island of resistance, of independence in France, I must ask this question. Are we a laboratory for all? Or are we a specific French story? Why I ask that? I must say, like Simona presents the Spain situation, I must tell you that my country is not as the reputation said, the country of the human rights. It's only the country of the declaration of human rights. And the situation now, with the neoconservative people, they came from the left, yes, but there is many sorts of neoconservative. It's a demonstration that in Europe, in the whole Europe, the weakest democracy is the French one. The state of emergency, the decay of the nationality, the politics of fear, laws against the right to know, against the freedom of speech, laws of general surveillance, terrorism as a pretext against the society. That's our situation now. And this situation reveal the weak of our democratic culture, our Bonapartism, our Caesarism, that sort of unicity of the power, no pluralism, no tradition of debate, to share opinion, to create new solution. And that's the challenge now for the French society. There is no solution at the top. We must create a new way. What's the society? And finally, Mediapart is probably the result of that against the oligarchy. You know, I speak about the right to know. It's a run between uh, the old world that is finished, but they want to stay at the power, and the new world that is here. We want to, but it's just the beginning. In the interval, there is the monsters, the monsters of hate, of fears. I just quote now Antonio Gramsci about crisis, about time of transition. But Gramsci says also, I say that to all of us about all the dangers of the moment. You know, there is the pessimism of intelligence to understand the situation, the challenge, but there is also the optimism of will. And in this time, our will is to organize all this fight for the right to know and to thanks for all the heroes of this battle for the century, I think to Chelsea Manning, to Julian Assange, and to Edward Snowden. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was quite interesting for me to learn that the special legal protections for journalists I talked about before obviously does not mean so much anymore in France. Uh, so it's a good point when journalists become more involved in what we call direct action, actually bringing the, the topics to the street. So our next speaker, at least here in Germany, I would not have the need to, uh, to introduce him, is Markus Beckedahl. Uh, he runs the uh, Netzpolitik org blog I mentioned in my introduction notes before. You know, I'm so happy uh, you're not trying to be objective. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, he's here with us to talk about Netzpolitik. 
Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I try to be fast. I hope not so fast. Um, yeah, NetzPolitik um, is a blog, or we started as a blog. Now we are a media, a media with around 50,000 uh, readers every day, which is not a small blog anymore. Um, we say we are not objective, we are subjective. We report in a journalistic way from a perspective on digital rights, and we are tra very transparent on it. Um, transparent also means that we share a lot of our documents we receive. Uh, we uh, are very transparent when it comes to our incomes, um, the money we receive from our readers. And we don't have a real business model, because on the one side, we don't like advertisement, online advertisement, uh, which tracks us as users. So we don't want to rely our work on uh, that our users, our readers are being tracked by other companies, and we don't like paywalls too. So our business model, or if you want to call it a business model, is our readers pay us or give us donation so that we can stay free and open for everyone and so that we can stay independent. Um, this is how our site looks like. Uh, we always say, okay, uh, if you have good content, then it's, uh, you don't really need a good design. But uh, we are working on a better design. <laughs> and you can see on the right side uh, our cyber commissioner, Günther Ottinger. He is our best fundraiser at netspolitik.org. Um, last week, uh, we published uh, internal documents uh, around the Bundestag hack, uh, which is uh, our newest uh, investiga investigative story. Um, our parliament was hacked last year, maybe one time, maybe several times, nobody really now. Um, our documents we uh, shared um, with a, a long documentation showed um, that, um, yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, misinformation going on in the Bundestag and nobody really knows what really happened and it shows that uh, yeah, the security in the parliament is not as good as you would imagine. Um, yeah, our donation side, um, it's... That's us. Um, we are in the moment seven, but these are only the seven people working full-time or half-time uh, uh, in our office, which is very small, but 10 minutes around the corner. But uh, this is not the whole team. We have a huge team of contributors um, who are friends, uh, who are activists, who are journalists, who uh, contribute their story on their um, favorite topics. And so we are more or less a very networked uh, editorial team, which is um, not the same concept as normal um, organizations, media organizations work, but we have the internet, so uh, we are very connected and uh, we are working more like an open source um, uh, project than a traditional uh, media team. And we say we do not only ob obtain documents, we publish them. We think it is very important, especially for a media organization which says we are not sub, uh, objective, we are subjective, that we share our original documents with our readers so they can ask uh, themselves if they can trust us on our reporting. This is a very unusual thing. Um, before the internet, you uh, didn't have uh, enough space in a newspaper or on a radio um, show to, um, um, yeah, to share your original documents you receive as journalist without metadata and stuff like this. But now we have the internet and we, um, uh, we grew up with linking to sources. We grew up with um, asking if a, um, a source is trustworthy or not. And we believe that it's very important for us as journalists to share our documents with our readers. Maybe we are wrong. Then our readers can help us uh, and can control us. And this is an important aspect, um, we think. Um, I need to drink something. This is the um, um, Bundestag. 
the Inquiry Committee on the NSA scandal. And this is one of our main topics at netspolitik.org because um, there, uh, there are public hearings in the Bundestag, but without any live stream um, and um, without any protocols, official protocols. So since two years, we go into every hearing and we write a close to a uh, live transcript protocol of every hearing to create a public debate and uh, to create uh, a protocol where other people who are not able to go at a time to this um, hearing in Berlin can read what happens there. And maybe this was one of the reasons why, yeah, here's a live blog, why we later um, received some information uh, we then published. Um, it was in the beginning of last year, we received um, documents, budget plans of our interior secret service, the um, Bundesamt für Verfassungsschutz. And these budget plans showed that um, two years after the start of the Snowden revelations, the answers of uh, our secret services and our government was to see the Snowden revelations as a white paper to uh, build up our own um, uh, internet surveillance. We published these documents. Our aim was uh, to create a public debate around whether it is a constitutional uh, question if the uh, Secret Service is allowed to do mass surveillance on the internet and social media or not. Unfortunately, uh, there wasn't a real big society uh, or debate within society. Um, some um, two months later, we um, uh, published a second um, budget plan, a newer one, but no debate either. It was not our fault. We tried, but yeah, sometimes uh, other things are happening. But then, uh, on the 30th of July, we received a letter, which was some kind of a strange letter, because our general prosecutor told us that investigations uh, on treason were going on against Andre Meister, um, our editor who wrote the article, against me as the uh, legal responsibility, uh, responsible person, and our sources. This was something new for us. Um, we didn't knew that treason was still in place. Treason is a very high symbolic thing uh, in 1962. Der Spiegel published uh, interior information about um, um, the military in Germany, the uh, state went after the Spiegel with treason. Uh, it was a scandal which changed the society in Germany and uh, which brought us a lot of press freedom. But now, 50 years later, we received a letter telling us that um, there's, um, yeah, um, we are traitors or close to traitors, uh, or the state thinks we might be traitors, and they started investigations against us. Yeah, we put it on the internet. And it was um, crazy for us, because Landesverrat means that you must have a motivation to damage uh, Germany. And we thought, why? Uh, our motivation was to start a public debate whether these plans of the secret services might violate Germany because it might be unconstitutional. And so we were very um, calm comparing to um, that we are close to traitor, uh, traitors. Um, we got a very big solidarity from everywhere of the world, so thank you, especially this community here, who helped us a lot. Um, and it was crazy for us, this is me and Andre, because on the left side, as it's me, uh, Germany, land of ideas, we just re uh, received an award that we are uh, uh, awarded place. Uh, the award was uh, brought by uh, German industry and our German president. And on the other side, the other part of the state thought we are traitors. So we, are a bit, uh, we were a bit confused what was right or not. Uh, I think you can imagine. But at the end, um, uh, there was a huge scandal going on. Um, nobody uh, wanted to be responsible anymore in the government. The general prosecutor was fired five days after we published uh, his letter. Uh, ten days later, the charges were dropped. We were very unhappy because um, we had lots of fun. And uh, especially we had lots of donations coming in. And we were able to go to the constitutional court. And since they dropped the charges, we weren't uh, anymore um, able to go to the constitutional court 
to get it uh, written that we are every time right. And we had some other questions facing up where we thought, okay, we need some better laws or maybe some better court rulings to uh, get better or more modern press freedom laws. For example, we had luck. Andre and me, we are journalists because we earn our money with journalism. And we have a press card and all the stuff you need to be an official um, German uh, journalist. But we are working in an open editorial team with people who work in their spare time as journalists for us. They do everything you can imagine what a journalist should um, do, but they are not as protected as we are with an official press card, uh, working officially uh, full-time as journalists. And we wanted um, to uh, get a court ruling that these people who work as journalists but don't get money for it have the same protection as we do have. So, the charges are dropped, but we have some money left, so we go to the Constitutional Court soon because the German government decided uh, that we need the reintroduction of the data retention. And in the index of the data retention, there's a, a new thing called Datenhehlerei. I'm sorry, I can't really um, translate it to uh, English. But it means that we are working as journalists together with hackers. If we receive lots of uh, big data sets and we want to do some kind of data journalism or other things, we believe that our partners, we cooperate in a team, are not as protected as us. And we want to use this court ruling with uh, the last donations from the Landesverratsing to get more and better press freedom rules in Germany. So, this is our motto, fight for digital rights. Our, our motivation is also to, um, yeah, to motivate other people to get engaged. There are uh, not enough people working on all these issues. There are lots of people who read us, but we always uh, try to train our readers to get motivated and to, get, to be engaged in democratic debates. There are lots of debates going on around the raising so uh, digital society. So take part, um, support others who take part, and never give up. Thanks. Thank you very much, Markus. Um, I mean, you came nicely back to the points I had into my, in my introduction, and uh, hopefully we can get back to these points um, <clears throat> later in the discussion as well. But we have one last speaker here. It's Rob Inberg from the Netherlands. He is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Tech Correspondent. Um, and when I introduced uh, uh, Edwi, I said uh, there are so few online, independent online daily newspapers, news media. Uh, the Tech Correspondent, of course, is another one. So we are, have nearly all of them here on the, on the stage, which is great, right? <laughs> Uh, so, Rob, uh, please go ahead, and as a philosopher, you might give us some new insights into the more philosophic questions I raised in the beginning. So. Let's see. Um, yeah, thank you. <coughs> you, you have had uh, Spanish, English, uh, French, English, and German English. Now you get the worst of them all, which is Dutch English. Um, <coughs> um, uh, let, me, let me start uh, um, with what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about business models uh, because um, I think uh, journalists have been uh, obsessed with this question which is actually not that hard to figure out. A business model has been the same for, I think, uh, a few thousand years now. You think of something that has value for people, you ask for some money, and in the end, if they give it to you, then you um, spend a little less than you get and you have a business model. Um, I, I, all these discussions about business model, all, uh, what struck me most, if you, if you, I've been to all these panels, and um, what, what strikes me uh, again and again is that um, apparently somehow journalists always think there's something wrong with the model or with the audience, who is not willing to pay for journalism or uh, not for digital journalism anyway, um, but rarely do they think about um, their own product. Um, 
uh, journalism in many cases is not a, a very great product um, and certainly not a certain kind of journalism. Journalism that uh, surrounds us every day uh, for the most part of the day, which is news. Um, so if you, we, the correspondent was um, founded upon the idea that we had to do something about this core product that is 21st century journalism, uh, which is uh, the news. And we wanted to uh, think of something that actually repairs a lot of flaws in this product. Um, so we, this is our slogan, by the way. It's, it sounds way better in Dutch. Um, but we try to be an antidote to the, na the daily news grind. And why do you need an antidote to... Um, uh, the, the, the news. Um, the news in general, and, and not only in uh, the Netherlands, but almost in every country I visited, is basically the same, and it has the basic same flaws. Um, news is almost always about exceptions, and never about rules. Um, which sounds very logical, but if you think about it, if you watch the world through news and news only, you'll get to see the world by its exceptions. Uh, and what that means is that basically you end up knowing how the world doesn't work. Um, and that is completely the opposite of the promise most journalists in, new, in the news industry give to their audience when they say, you have to follow me, you have to read what I have to say, um, uh, and then you understand what is going on, current affairs. Actually, the opposite is quite true. You're not um, seeing what is going on in, in any way. Um, you're just seeing the exceptions. A, a Dutch a friend of mine, a Dutch journalist, very smart journalist, Joris Luyendijk, maybe you've heard of him, he, had, he has a, 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 a book in German out, Germany out as well uh, about the financial sector. He said, news is always about what happens today, but never about what happens every day. Um, which is quite true, and what happens every day is much more important and much more influential on our daily lives. Um, um, questions like, why didn't journalists see the financial crisis coming, for example, or why isn't the um, climate change on the front page every day, actually boil down to the this, this same flaw. Uh, uh, um, uh, climate change, for example, happens every day, not just today. Um, banks taking risks that end up in a financial crisis happens every day, not just today. So we try to write about things that happen every day and try to write in a, in a way that is newsworthy to people. Um, Another big flaw of news is very, very superficial. We have heard the, 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 the commercial reasons for this. Uh, uh, news uh, should be entertaining. It's some kind of infotainment. But in general, if you look at how news is framed, how news is produced, you cannot um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, be surprised that uh, the end result is superficiality. Um, most news has to be about today and has to be made in one day. Um, uh, most journalism uh, is, is, is only a few hours old, and if it's uh, older than that, then it's already um, passed. So you get superficial information. And then the third biggest big flaw is that news is almost always about what go goes wrong, and it's pretty destructive in the end. Uh, I, I, don't, I can't imagine... Uh, somebody watching the news for a week, 24 hours a day, and not uh, think the world is going the wrong direction. One of the biggest blind spots, for example, of news is how the world gets better every day, and it does. If nobody here in, the, in, the, in this um, audience wants to trade with anybody in the 19th century or before. Um, so, actually, we try to um, uh, write a lot about that as well. So, we wanted to... This was the basic idea for our platform. Can we change the definition of what is newsworthy? Um, and you can, if you say, okay, we're going to look at the foundational instead of the sensational. We're going to try to do journalism in depth, not superficially. And we're going to take a constructive approach, not just write about what goes wrong, but also about what gets better. And this 
apparently this idea um, appealed to a lot of people. We started out with a crowdfunding. We didn't want to do anything uh, with banks or loans or investors. We just said, if you like this idea, if you want to be make it a reality, just support us. And actually, almost 19,000 people did in 2013, which is quite a lot of people in a country uh, with 17 million inhabitants like the Netherlands. Uh, we actually set, I think, a world record in journalism crowdfunding at that time, um, uh, which was a, a, a great surprise to us. Um, and since then, since the crowdfunding, we have, oh, this is what we raised, uh, actually. Um, we have been building this platform, and the platform uh, is basically, uh, uh, um, you can go on the platform only if you are, are a subscriber, but you can share everything we do with anybody without limits. Um, this paywall discussion is also a very interesting one um, but, uh, because uh, uh, you want to um, have a reason for people to support you, but uh, otherwise uh, you don't want to miss any audience out there that doesn't know you yet. Um, so basically what we do is we make four or five stories a day uh, we currently employ um, almost 40 people and um, uh, we try to write stories that go beyond uh, what you are used to in a general news media outlet. And um, there are basic principles for this platform. We, we have a lot of, uh, the correspondent has a lot in common with the people on stage here uh, because um, we too, for example, say we are a subjective platform so no objectivity here it's a, it's for one thing it's an illusion and if you try to be objective you're you're removing yourself from the world you're actually trying to engage in uh, objectivity ha uh, has its logic 19th century logic but it's uh, uh, actually um, uh, not a very good idea uh, in the 21st century you want to engage people in the world uh, with the world you are writing about so then you have to be engaging yourself uh, you have to be explicit about your uh, 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 views, um, nonetheless. Um, so we are basically an author-centered platform. Uh, you follow the correspondence in his or her respective uh, subject matter. Uh, so every story we publish clearly uh, says who is uh, uh, writing the story and what his or her expertise is. We all have, um, all the correspondents have their own niche uh, subject matters or expertise that they write about. So for example, uh, Dimitri Tokmetsis, who is here on, this, on the screen, is our uh, correspondent da data and transparency. He writes a lot about surveillance state and uh, stuff like that. <coughs> and basically, uh, we did try to think about the design as well we, because we uh, we actually uh, one of our founders is a design agency and they said well you have to have the philosophy of your content also in your uh, design as well so the first thing we did which may sound a little bit weird is um, we took out all the links uh, I know the internet is about the links, but the design of the link on the internet is not that good. We are all about providing context to the world, so we have to provide context to our links as well. So we took out the links out of the text and we put them next to them, where we can explain where you are going. Um, links uh, are um, a distraction for a lot of readers because they see the underlining and they want to know where they're going, but they don't know, and then if they uh, leave and are disappointed, then. Um, that's not a good thing. If they leave and they're not disappointed, they won't come back. So you uh, have to explain where you're sending them if you link uh, to some place. We also have these info cards in the text. Uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, journalism is, just isn't read because it presumes too much knowledge. Um, most people uh, know a lot about one thing, but uh, know nothing about most things. That goes for all of us. So you have to explain a lot. And that's where the info card, uh, uh, the little red um, arrows in the, in, the, um, uh, in the text come in handy. You can open them and then explain uh, what you're talking about. Um, of course, oh, that's the info card, yes. Um, we make use of all uh, uh, um, uh, new digital media, uh, uh, things like uh, infographics, etc., etc. That's not very interesting um, uh, because it's all too common. But what we um, especially try to do, and it's all at 
below the article is the conversation um, we have with our members. Because this is the most important part. We invest a lot of time and energy into it to get this conversation to be as interesting or um, if it's possible even more interesting than the, the journalism we produce ourselves. Uh, the basic idea is um, there are a lot of people out there who know stuff. Um, if you put uh, a thousand doctors into one room, they probably know a little bit more about healthcare than the one medical journalist you have on your team. And getting them to share their knowledge and expertise on your platform is crucial for, I think, the future of journalism. But there are a few ways... Uh, the, the, uh, last year um, alone in the Netherlands, three major uh, uh, publications, a magazine and two newspapers, uh, shut down their comment section because uh, um, it was um, hijacked by all these, you know the commenters, uh, with their conspiracy theories and with their uh, uh, dirty language, uh, uh, foul language about the world around them. Um, and the reason for this is there's no real investment into the comment section. We actually don't speak of comments. Uh, we we um, say in Dutch there, bijdragen, which means contributions. We want you to contribute your knowledge and expertise, not comment on uh, certain subject matters. If you w want comments, uh, then you'll probably get opinions, and the, the louder the opinion, uh, the, the less informed probably the opinionator is. Um, so what we do is, we um, uh, first of all, we uh, ask our journalists to participate in this conversation. Very important part. Uh, I sti I'm still amazed um, that um, most of online journalism that comes from traditional newspapers is exactly the same uh, as it was before. Uh, meaning, there's no journalist there. Uh, you publish your story, you go home. And then you see the comments and you are baffled by how bad the comments are. That's because you're not there. You have to talk back. So at least half of the work we let our journalists do is talk to our members. And ask them questions or answer their questions. And um, we all do this um, with real names. No fake names, no... Uh, uh, no, nothing, just real names. We check the names, they are linked to the bank account. You can only uh, respond if you are a member, paying member. So, and uh, um, besides the name, you can add your expertise. And many people do. Some people say they're an expert on, every, on everything, I know. But most people just say, uh, state their uh, studies or their job description or their experience in something. So, for example, when we write about healthcare, we see a lot of doctors or a lot of patients or a lot of um, uh, 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 managers in hospitals participating in this conversation. And this conversation really is an important factor in our journalism. It, um, uh, it, it helps us understand uh, topics, it, it creates new stories, it creates updates, and it really um, um, also um, uh, strengthens the loyalty of the readership. Uh, you're not just there passively consuming uh, uh, what you find interesting, you can actually contribute to the journalism as well. Which is very important because um, ask any general uh, um, uh, person uh, what they think of their newspaper if they read one. And then basically they say the same thing, uh, always. They say, well, it's fine except for, and then their occupation or their study come in, and they say, well, I know a lot more about that. They're, they're not understanding this. So if you allow people to voice what they know, not what they think, but what they know, then um, they, um, their loyalty becomes a lot bigger. This is basically, this, this sums up uh, the whole philosophy behind it. Um, and actually, um, let them share what you do and let them, let them be the ambassador of your journalism. Uh, uh, in the, in the yellow box there, you can see how p our members can share everything we do without limits with anybody. It's on you can put it on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on email, whatever you want. You can print it or make a PDF out of it. Uh, this really brings us the new members. So we have had, we exist for two and a half years now, we have had 40 to 45 new members get in every day. They can read us for free if you just know somebody who already paid for us and sent you everything, um, uh, you can read us for free, but they don't because they want to support the cause. Um, it's really, pay, the paywall, paywalls are basically 
the one or the point one percent of people who want a free ride. Most of people, if they like you, if they find it important what you do, then they will pay anyway. We also do meetups like this. Very important. The conversation is not just an online conversation. We have to um, um, meet the people we um, uh, do journalism for uh, uh, real in real life. Um, um, all of our evenings, whether it's on Europe or on surveillance or on uh, whatever topic, always have been uh, sold out within a day. We make books out of our um, journalism as well. Um, uh, um, we're not against uh, traditional paper uh, outlets. If it's the best form you can uh, publish something in, please do. Um, this was our first book. This is, uh, we also publish e-books. And uh, this is our third uh, book. It sold 25,000 copies already uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and we built our own editor uh, because basically most CMSs out there are publishing platforms, which means they're not really built to have a conversation with your audience. It's, a, it's basically the printing press only in a digital form. We tried to build a editor that actually facilitates the whole conversation between journalists and their audiences, or the people formerly known as the audience, as uh, Jay Rosen would say. Um, and we hope to one day, when it's, uh, when it's um, licensable, we, ha we hope to license it to other uh, uh, platforms that might do a crowdfunding or um, might want to build a community uh, themselves. And everything is very personal, so the, the whole idea of subjective journalism is in, um, in, in the design as well. So, for example, our logo is the handwriting of our designer. Um, and, oh yeah, that's me. Um, I, don't, I don't really look like that anymore. I'm a little bit younger. Um, and uh, uh, we don't have a marketing or sales department because everybody that works um, uh, for us uh, is in marketing and in sales, because journalists have to learn to sell their own um, uh, journalism, not just on social media or, um, or, or, or um, um, on a podium, but also getting, to, getting members in. So every um, um, uh, um, card we have has a free subscription for a month um, uh, um, uh, on the back. I'll uh, do this in one minute. And it has been quite successful, so I already said we have 45 new members getting in every day. Uh, we now are a little over 46,000 paying subscribers. This has been uh, since the beginning. Um, uh, we have 136,000 followers on Facebook. We, we are getting to the 1 million unique visitors a month. Actually, last month was our best month, 2.2 million visitors. And basically what we're trying to do is get from a publication to a platform where people belong, uh, feel uh, that, that they can add value themselves and get value for themselves. We want journalists not to just be sending out information, uh, but to act as conversation leaders in this, um, about this information. And basically, give a role to all these people in what we try to do be, uh, uh, which is a network. And then uh, the most important part I say for last, because I already heard it uh, uh, quite a few um, uh, times already, which is ad-free. If, uh, if you are uh, charging people for money for your journalism, that is enough. Um, uh, so no banners, no pop-ups, no wallpaper advertising, or even worse, native advertising, no ad words, no advertorials, which is um, uh, uh, ruining journalism uh, uh, everywhere, especially in the Netherlands now. Uh, just 100% ad-free. You can do without, uh, and hopefully we uh, will uh, uh, conquer the world with it. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh, it's on time. So I think we heard some four very interesting different approaches, but from what I take with this is some common grounds as well. And one of these common grounds was what I mentioned with journalistic with a course. 
nobody here seems to take objectivism uh, any, any important anymore. Everyone knows that whatever you say, whatever you do, and even if you pretend to be an, op an, uh, 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 an objective journalist, by just choosing the story you work on, you express your opinion and uh, uh, what you believe in. Um, so I think we can leave that behind. But we still have a little bit of things to discuss, I think. So please, please audience, uh, think of questions as well. Uh, I think we have uh, something to pass on. But uh, I, I want to mention, I would still like to have probably a short answer from, from each of you uh, on the question is, is journalism, is that, is that a class with privileges? Who does decide who gets called a journalist? Does that offer anything more than, well, let's say just, just a self-image? Does it really have some legal protection to come with it? Uh, in most countries probably uh, that's not true anyway. Uh, does it matter so much that journalism has to exclude people who are not making a living by journalism, by, by writing something, but just doing it part-time or in their spare time? Does that make really a difference? But Shall I ask some questions also? Gather some questions? Let me sure. do one round. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, question mainly for Rob um, about the timing of your crowdfunding campaign. Did you just decide to launch one day or was there a particular kind of political moment in the Netherlands that presented an opportunity? Okay. Please answer, no more questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the, the, the opportunity was very simple. I was fired from my last job. <laughs> so that gave me uh, time and, um, and also a little bit of m media um, because I was editor-in-chief of a, a national newspaper before, so it was in the news that I was fired because I wanted to do this at the newspaper I worked. Um, they didn't like it. Uh, so actually, no, uh, there was no real uh, moment. You, um, uh, it was just, let's do it now. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, because you all have explored new ways of connecting to your audience. Does that also mean that the way you do your investigations has changed? I mean, Simona, you just did it at the kitchen table, apparently, and you got all the other kitchen tables to join you. You also want to be on the kitchen table. So how does it change your research? And if it's an investigation you do? Uh, I said, the thing is that we have this uh, leaks box in which we, we are kind of the intermediary from the leaks we received and the mainstream or corporative press. So uh, the, we, we had to do a um, workshop for uh, journalists because we have now 60 journalists, but we have really to force them to, for example, understand that they have to have a minimum privacy and security devices. And also when we give information and the information doesn't go through, then we publish it. So we have now blogs in uh, several newspapers so that we are publishing the information. But we were not supposed to be the journalist of the story. We were supposed to be activists and our goal was the one of uh, activating people that they are leaking to become themselves also agent and try to denounce this on trials. So we, we are journalists because we are forced to be, because that it doesn't go through. And answering to what you say, uh, I think that the, the journalists are really part of the system. The, the, the press is fundamental because it's the propaganda of the system. So it's not just uh, a matter of marketing. It's a matter that if uh, they open it up, the system uh, it loses propaganda. Okay, I have a question to uh, Markus Bekedal. Uh, the in investigation uh, of Landesverrat uh, seemed so absurd to many people that you might ask what's the motive behind? And there was a comment in the Telepolis uh, newspaper that the real purpose was to uh, legally open um, um, uh, investigations, methods of investigations that, uh, well, when, once this door was open, the purpose was filled and they could even close the investigations. Could you comment about that later? So I gather more questions? Bernd, or what do you want? Yeah, do you want uh, for Simona, um, when you receive uh, documents, how do you verify the authenticity of those documents and that they are not faked or doctored? 
Thank you. Maybe one more question. Yeah. Just a question probably for uh, all of you, very simple. I, I work in, in Italy as an investigative journalist and I spend a lot of time and have a lot of problems with uh, with have been sued for uh, like 50 millions of euros and so on. I used to work for the public television, now I don't. I wonder, what's the deal with you? I mean, do you have a, like a, a, a legal affair, staff? Do you have, a, do you have a, like lawyers that work for you? And how much money do you invest every, every year? I know that Media part had a lot of uh, attacks from uh, from the fisc as well. From the, I mean, this is a, 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 a big a big topic for me. I just want if you can just give me an answer on that. Thanks. Maybe we should start with that question, Ian, because it relates to the first question we had anyway about the Landesverrat case. Uh, so maybe Edwi, you want to yes. contribute for this question? Uh, I understand that uh, about the next speech. The question of the, the, the model, the economic model, uh, is not probably the more interesting question. Uh, I, I do agree with all the editorial invention, and I can demonstrate that about Mediapart. But I think, because I was not fired, but I dismissed from the old press about the crisis of independence, <laughs> This moment, it's a moment of the old press is weak and oligarchs from our dealings, from luxury, from finance, from banking, control even the old, the ancient independent press. Le Monde was controlled by all the people who create the value. It's finished. And I, I fight, I dismiss and I fight about that. I say, if you accept that, you will be sold. And finally, they are sold. Even to an oligarch, a billionaire, who create from telephony, from the digital world. But he is an oligarch. And that's the reason for me. The first question, we must, because we, we got all the same ideas, and we trust first the society and the social movement. I do agree with that. But as professional, the first condition of independence is to be profitable. With no dependence from state money, from advertising, from finance, and that's the question. And finally, to reply to your precise question, Mediapart, there is many trials against us, many procedures, and so on. We have a very, very we trust our lawyers because it was my lawyer even 40 years ago, even with my military service, which was uh, very special during the <coughs> 70s, I'm not young, okay? And, and finally, it cost for us uh, exactly uh, 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 150,000 by year for all the lawyers. Uh, no more, more than 100 trials, okay. and we lost only three of them. Thank you. So, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a legal department, <laughs> but uh, we have uh, big support by our readers, and we have lots of uh, lawyers under our readers. Um, and we even have a judge in our editorial team, but his main job is being a judge, and his hobby is uh, to write for us. So, if we have legal questions or if we go to court, for, uh, ex um, as, um, especially for freedom of uh, information requests, uh, we can rely on a small hand of very trustworthy uh, and good-willing um, lawyers. But um, sometimes we think uh, it's, uh, we need some um, inside lawyers, so or it would be more helpful because the threats are coming more often after us, and not only uh, copyright violation things, which is the most used uh, thing for journalists, I think. I'm um, coming to the other question um, before. We still don't know uh, much about the motivation to go after us on treason. So the, uh, um, the surveillance thing might be one thing, but uh, the federal police who started the investigation 
they had the full, um, uh, theoretically, the full use of anti-terror surveillance um, things uh, to go after us, but they said they didn't do it. So they only did limited uh, surveillance stuff, uh, like asking for our ba bank uh, accounts and where we live. Uh, we don't know how trustworthy the answer of our government is that our interior secret service didn't do it. Uh, the Verfassungsschutz is not very trustworthy, uh, as you might know from the NSU scandal or other scandals. Um, maybe the main motivation was, on the one side, to send a warning signal to all the journalists who are digging into this whole surveillance scandal around uh, secret services uh, getting uh, uh, yeah, on, uh, on steroids, uh, on internet surveillance. Maybe it was a bigger message and a warning message to whistleblowers because it was about two years minimum in prison for us and to our whistleblowers, up to lifetime sentence. So it was something we just heard about from repressive regimes until we find out it's possible in Germany too for our jobs what, or our job what we are working on. So we had the protection of the um, public, but our whistleblowers, there are still investigations going on and there might be a warning for all whistleblowers. And then there's another legal... Uh, uh, maybe maybe, maybe okay. that is going too far. Actually, okay. we have two last questions, uh, which could probably shortly be answered, because we are simply running out of time. We started late, I know. I, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, time is limited. People want to go for, for dinner. So if there are two more important questions... Yeah, uh, I was hoping that uh, any of you could have some ideas or suggestions for uh, publishing models that could be financially viable in the global south, specifically sub-Saharan Africa. Second question here. Hi, I'm Ninka. Thank you so much for your contributions. I have a question as a funder, which is uh, especially to Edwi and to Marcus. I already know Rob's answer to this one, I think, though perhaps the rest might be interested. If you do accept uh, a shareholder or funding or a grant from an, a different, from an outsider, what would be your rules? What would be your criteria to accept such a funder or such a shareholder? Because it's fantastic to be able to be sustainable on subscriptions, but I think sometimes you need an extra investment. How do you go about that? You, you mean our the first investment to create to create media part? You, you mean that? Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, we put our money. <laughs> yeah, do you ever accept money from... No, we, we control our, the co-founders. We put our economy, I don't know the word in English, uh, nos economy in French, <laughs> our money. I take a loan, I take... Uh, uh, and I, uh, I, I, until uh, 2017, I, I gave the money to the bank myself. I say that because I think we must take our risk. <laughs> we must take our risk when we fight. And we, we take, create a friendship society with the donors for our adventure. And we got, it's explained there, there is all the details, we got some, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some, some partners and we they are not in the oligarchy, and we buy them step by step. And we want to create Mediapart as a non-profit society. Or the co-founder, we will give our part of Mediapart to the team of Mediapart. We, it cost Mediapart at the beginning five million to arrive to the uh, break even and to be profitable. Five million. It's not big money, but it was our money. <laughs> we, we, we were not linked to <laughs> anybody. <laughs> I, I think the question was more around uh, getting money from donations, uh, for foundations, and uh, we never received money from donation, uh, foundations yet, because there are no foundations in Germany supporting our kind of work, or we never met someone, but uh, I think 
so we, we don't have clear rules. We are thinking about it theoretically. Um, uh, if we uh, accept some kind of, some kind of um, funds from a foundation, it, we must stay totally editorial independent. Uh, it must be a donation or a fund, so we are not getting dependent on a foundation. So uh, it should be uh, a mix, for example, uh, 20% of our total income or not more should come from an external foundation. This is a theoretically model that uh, could work. And then it depends which kind of foundation. So we wouldn't accept money from everyone. Uh, we also say we wouldn't accept any money from Google or Deutsche Telekom to stay independent. So we uh, wouldn't take money from the Bertelsmann Foundation too. Um, and can I ask to, because we have to go, that maybe Rob, you can answer the other question I'm about so the sorry. Global South? We're, we're running out of time. I'm not an expert sorry. on Global South. We need to have an answer on the Global South question, though. <laughs> what do you think? Maybe Rob or maybe Simona? No future. I mean, uh, we, we just <laughs> open a, a crowdfunding for the next step, and uh, I think that there is a, this idea of getting uh, funding from the people in already in Spain and in Italy and in Greece, it's very difficult. It's not like in North, Northern Europe. So I am not the one who can answer the question because I yes, think it's very is. difficult to make it sustainable. Okay. There Thank is an example very... like us in, in uh, South America. I was in Colombia. There was many, many uh, uh, net of, uh, of uh, pure players. We discussed about the model. At this time, the model is uh, free with advertising. I explain why I think they must fight to convince the people, even small part, to pay. We, we are got a partnership. Spanish is a global language, like English and Chinese now. And uh, we got a partner in uh, Spain, that's Info Libre. Simona worked with, him, with her, with them, excuse me. Uh, and uh, Info Libre is a mixed model. There is a part public, free with advertising, and if you are subscribers, there is no advertising, and you have you got uh, many advantages. I think there is no one model, but I got a co one conviction: we must fight for the value of information to explain to the people. <laughs> Thank you very much. The value of information is a good conclusion.